Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. This month, we're at Ellis Island to celebrate October's National Family History Month. Did you know more than 12 million immigrants came on this island and walked through these doors? Between 1890 and 1954, they traveled from Europe and Asia and came through this inspection center. Today, we take a look at some of their stories and how they shaped Asian American history. Here's more. Coming to America, a look at the wave of immigration from the Philippines. The Dreamers, Paul Lin goes inside the world of undocumented college students. And it's one step for man. Minnie Rowe talked to the first Asian American astronaut who commanded the International Space Station. Imagine arriving on this island with just one suitcase. Well, this is where immigrants checked in their luggage before going through inspection. And it's now part of Ellis Island's Peopling of America exhibit. Kyung Yoon has more. From 1892 to 1954, some 12 million people came through Ellis Island's immigration station. Today, it's estimated that more than 40% of all Americans can trace their family history to someone who passed through this historic processing station. America has a history of welcome, a history of opening the door, a history of immigration. We're a nation of immigrants. Stephen Briganti heads the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation, which was responsible for reopening Ellis Island to the public in 1990. What we found out once we opened the Ellis Island years uh, in 1990 is that um, a lot of people didn't connect because their families hadn't come through Ellis Island. They'd come either through a different port or uh, whole different areas of the country. It became clear as America is diversifying its population rather steadily. And by 2040, white Europeans will be just another minority. There won't be a majority. Uh, that we really needed to tell the story of people who have come since Ellis Island closed in 1954. And that's what we set out to do to tell the story of post-Ellis and pre-Ellis, and thereby cover uh, most of the history of the populating of America. The result is the Peopling of America Center, which opened in May at the newly renamed Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration. The exhibit goes far beyond Ellis Island, covering the history of American immigration from as early as the 1550s to the present day. So you want Ellis Island to be relevant to all Americans, whether or not you or your ancestors might have come through that island. Yes, that's the goal, is uh, Ellis Island is now the National Museum of Immigration, and it is there to tell the whole story, to connect to everyone. Uh, whether you came, whether you're, you or your ancestors came through Ellis Island or Boston or Philadelphia or San Francisco, or Galveston, or New Orleans. Um, this is the place that tells the story. I came from Pakistan with $100 in my pocket and lots of dreams. The exhibits contain many different stories and voices sharing their experiences of coming to America and building a life here. Stephen Briganti says if you listen carefully, it's remarkable just how similar the stories are. They are different from the standpoint of different people different modes of transportation, different uh, levels of education, the people who were coming. But it was pretty much the same of people looking for a better life, people looking for new opportunities. But on the whole, that's what it's always been. I think they come here to uh, look for a new life and better themselves and work with the opportunities that are here. And that is the American dream. And the, and the American, and, and the way the American system has always worked. The exhibit doesn't shy away from controversial topics like illegal immigration or the uglier sides of American history in which people were brought over to this country against their will or systematically excluded because of race. Unfortunately, look, color, religion, um, 
have been something that has been used to um, exclude. In the 1870s, a law was passed that excluded the Chinese from coming to America. In 2013, the last year that we have figures for, Chinese were the largest group of immigrants to America. So it took 100 years, but um, the situation definitely changed. According to the latest U.S. Census, Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group in America, and more than 60% of this population growth is fueled by immigration. And Briganti says the pattern of American immigration has been that virtually every arriving group has faced discrimination and animosity from those who had arrived earlier. When the Irish came, nobody wanted them. When the Italians came, nobody wanted them, including the Irish didn't want them. And that has just gone on and on and on and on through history. And eventually these groups assimilate and they become Americans. Uh, they, and, and that means they have the same outlook on what life in America for them should be uh, and what they want it to be and what they try to make it to be. If you're interested in how this country got populated and how your family uh, became a part of it, you know we have the records uh, from 1892 to 1957, we have the, the copies of the manifests of arrival in America. And people can come to Ellis Island to do their research for their own family, or they can go on libertyellisfoundation.org and, and do it online. And that's an exciting thing to do because you see such information about your, your family that you didn't know. In honor of October's National Family History Month, the museum is expecting hundreds of visitors to stop by and trace their ancestral roots and history. Throughout the country, museums like this will be hosting genealogy events. This is a story that I was personally excited to cover. You see, I was born in South Korea, but have lived in this country for many years as a permanent resident, and just earlier this year became a naturalized U.S. citizen. I'm so proud to be able to call myself a new American who can add my story to this country that I call home. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. Thousands of immigrants came through this registry room, but little is known about the Filipinos who came in the early 1900s, that is, until now. I mean, this is him. In, this is him? This is him. That is a great photo. Dolores Alec has quite a collection of old photos, newspaper articles, and other mementos of her father's life. He worked with Doug Douglas MacArthur and he traveled with him around the world. He was Douglas MacArthur's uh, personal valet. His houseboy, he'd shine his shoes and make his rice and buck shine his buckles. Her family memories are now part of Filipino American history in New York. They are featured in a new book, Images of America, Filipinos in New York City, one of the few books to chronicle the immigration story of Filipinos in the Northeast. I think it was really important for, for me and for the Philippine American National Historical Society to put this book together because I think our stories need to be told. Um, oftentimes when you hear about the stories of Filipino Americans in the United States, you tend to hear about Filipinos on the West Coast or in Hawaii, um, and very seldomly do you hear about Filipino American stories on the East Coast. According to the U.S. Census, Filipinos are one of the fastest growing ethnic groups in the tri-state. 2013 census estimates more than 225,000 Filipinos in the New York, New Jersey area. But little is written about the history of Filipino migration to the Northeast. The Philippines and the United States have a long intertwined history. What readers will discover is Filipino migration to the New York area began soon after the Spanish-American War in 1898, when the Philippines became a U.S. colony. Wealthier Filipinos sent their children to New York University and Columbia for college. In 1915, more Filipinos came through Ellis Island. Between World War I and World War II, Filipino military servicemen arrived. 
The largest migration came in the 1960s after the 1965 Immigration Act was passed. For many of the earlier Filipino immigrants, life was difficult. Many don't know that in 1911, Filipinos were dressed as savages for Coney Island amusement park goers. They were uh, brought to the U.S. and to New York specifically um, to, uh, to show what quote-unquote savage life would be in the Philippines. Um, and so they were uh, housed at this amusement park called the Dreamland. And people who would go to the Dreamland would see these Filipinos dressed in um, native Filipino clothing, um, which they didn't even wear regularly anymore during that time. But just typically to, to show uh, what, what life was like for, for the Philippines. And, and um, it was incorrect, it was, it was dehumanizing, they treated them like circus animals. Like immigrant groups before them, there was discrimination along with cultural barriers. Joey Tobacco's father arrived in New York in the late 40s, raising his family in Long Island. For us kids, we didn't speak Tagalog. So, you know, at that time it was assimilate or die, the kind of thing that, you know, the Borg from Star Trek. So it was a different kind of... of, of society that we lived in at the time and and um, unlike today where we have diversity as an accepted cultural norm back then it was especially for New Yorkers you know you, you had to become a New Yorker otherwise you weren't going to make it here. Alec who grew up in Astoria also remembers the isolation. We were the only Filipino family among all these white people. So it was difficult. Um, I had no other brown friends. Uh, everybody else was Irish, Italian, German, uh, Greeks. Uh, it was difficult. To make matters worse, Alex's mother's family cut relations with her daughter because she had married a Filipino. Her father, meanwhile, kept the Filipino traditions from the homeland alive. He made Filipino traditions and Filipino culture a really very important part of growing up. And I went to every Filipino organization. Um, I was Miss Philippine America. We joined all the Filipino organizations as I was growing up. She continued to identify with her Filipino roots into adulthood. Alec is on the board of the Filipino American Historical National Society, FONS. And I just love the idea of FONS because they're preserving the Philippine American history. And the community feels the same. It was a packed house at a recent book launch at John Jay College where they sold out of the hard copies of the book. Cool. So make it out to you. George and Dolly. George and Dolly. I think there's such a thirst for people to, to learn about history, um, especially if it's one that hasn't been taught to us before. Um, so I think it really is our responsibility to, to teach others about our history. I'm Paul Lin. They're known as dreamers, the children of undocumented immigrants who came to the U.S. with their parents. Many aspire to go to college, and legally they can, but the cost to attend can be crushing. Just talk to Grace Couch, the daughter of undocumented Korean immigrants. She graduated from Stuyvesant High School, but unlike classmates who are U.S. citizens, Grace found her opportunities for higher education limited by her immigration status. Once I started applying to colleges, and then I realized that I don't have any financial aid. I can't get private loans. So um, pretty much if I cannot pay in cash, I cannot go to any college. In the U.S., there are an estimated one to two million undocumented students. Some 65,000 graduate from high school every year, but as little as 10% attend college. Without much access to loans or financial aid, students must raise cash to pay tuition, so it can take a long time to earn a bachelor's degree. Grace had additional problems. She felt like she couldn't talk to anyone, not even her parents. That left her, in turns, angry, depressed, and fearful, as well as feeling stuck in her situation. I felt like if I told my friends or my guidance counselor, they'll report me, and I'll be deported back to my country. And that really was not an option I wanted to consider because I've been living in America most of my life. Grace had cash from her family to attend the City College of New York. But when her father got sick, she had to quit school to work and save up tuition money. I worked pretty much everything. I worked as a cashier, as a waitress, after school teacher. I also worked in a law office as a paralegal for about five years. 
It was a frustrating time for Grace. Being undocumented for her just to find a string of menial cash jobs was hard enough. Beyond that, she felt a sense of hopelessness. Even if I do have a bachelor's degree or beyond, it, it will be a waste of money, to speak honestly, just because the company cannot hire me anyway. It's situations like Grace's that, over the years, prompted bipartisan support for immigration reform and proposal of the DREAM Act. It says that if your parents brought you here as a child, you've been here for five years, and you're willing to go to college or serve in our military, you can one day earn your citizenship. The DREAM Act would give these young people a chance to earn legal status since 2001, the DREAM Act has never passed Congress. So in 2012, President Obama initiated a partial solution, DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Undocumented youth can apply for temporary relief from deportation and a renewable work permit. After gaining DACA status, Grace finally had some hope. She applied to Queensborough Community College and got into its two-year nursing program. Good morning. My name is Grace. I'll be your nurse today. I don't have to hide in the shadows anymore. I could tell people what my status actually is, and I started to trust people more. People like Dr. Barbara Blake Campbell, who taught Grace clinical nursing at QCC. Grace felt a connection with her professor as a mentor and counselor, later entrusting her with details about her status. Grace stands on our own merit. I, I did not need to know the details. But I felt, you know, really honored that she would feel safe to impart this knowledge to me. Dr. Campbell then wrote a letter of reference for Grace's application to the Dream.US Scholarship. It's a fund for undocumented students with DACA status wanting to complete a bachelor's degree. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg recently donated $5 million to the fund. Grace applied and got the scholarship money to attend Hunter College, where she continues the study she started at QCC. She aims to earn a BS in nursing. Dr. Campbell applauds Grace's pursuit of education and the scholarship that's making it possible. The undocumented student, they're not going to disappear. By 2020, 65% of the jobs will require that we have a labor workforce that has education that goes beyond secondary education. A country that has good human capital is going to have a better economic future. Immigration reform has been a political football for years, and experts like Alan Wernick see it playing a big role again in the 2016 presidential election. We're still optimistic that there'll be some form of, dream, of the DREAM Act passed. It has a lot of bipartisan support. Even so, some fear that current policies like DACA may lose funding. To date, more than 700,000 DACA applications have been approved. CUNY Citizenship Now, for its part, has helped over 1,000 people apply for DACA. There are some people who are afraid. They are concerned that the program is uh, only for, uh, ex you know, it was two years. It's been extended for another two years. By 2016, there could be a different president, and that president could take it away. Supporters of immigration reform want to see some action, like United We Dream, a network of undocumented youth 100,000 members strong. Kevin Kang says no political party has really delivered. Neither the Republicans with their anti-immigrant slogans or the Democrats uh, with their promises that uh, we've seen over the years, uh, you know, they have failed to keep. Kevin and his organization believe in protecting current gains like DACA, but also holding politicians accountable for campaign promises, especially when it comes to preventing deportation from the U.S., this nation of immigrants. Millions of undocumented immigrants, not just people that have come here as children, but also our parents, also our families, also our neighbors who don't have families, people that want an opportunity to contribute to this country and to call this place their home. So we want to make sure that there is dignity for them and that there is actually fair treatment for them. Grace Couch knows what's at stake. As a supporter of immigration reform, she keenly understands why it's needed and why people oppose it. It's misunderstanding, she says, that makes people think the worst about undocumented immigrants. They think it's something that's in the shadows that they will never come across, but they don't know that it's their neighbors, their friends, who have these issues. We are contributing members of the society, but I think a lot of people do not realize that. Today, Grace's future is much brighter than just a few years ago. 
With DACA status, she is pursuing a college degree on scholarship, has been able to get a driver's license, bank account, and even a social security number. And yes, she pays taxes, all things many Americans take for granted. Undocumented students in the U.S. seeking the same educational opportunities as all Americans and eager to give back to the community as well. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. Considering there are only a handful of Asian American astronauts in the history of NASA, it's safe to say that Dr. Lior Chow is not just a pioneer in outer space, but a pioneer within the U.S. space program and the Asian American community. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Many of us can probably recall as children dreaming of one day growing up and becoming an astronaut. This little boy was no different, except he turned that dream into a reality. He says he will never forget his first flight in space. The Earth from space is so beautiful, and I remember looking down at places everywhere. It looks really nice and peaceful and beautiful, but I mean, intellectually, you know that some of the places you're flying over, there's war, there's famine, there's suffering, there's people dying probably at that very moment. And, you know, it's hard for me to kind of reconcile that difference because it looks so nice and peaceful and beautiful. United States astronaut Lee Roy Chow is a decorated pilot who holds the distinctive honor of being the first Asian American and ethnic Chinese to ever perform a spacewalk and serve as the commander of the International Space Station. He has logged a total of 229 days in space, flown on shuttle missions Columbia, Endeavour and Discovery, and served six months aboard the ISS. Five feet. Looking good, down a half. Forward. His fascination with space started as an eight-year-old boy growing up in Oakland, California, watching a man take a small but an immensely important step on a hot summer night. The eagle has landed. You know, I remember Walter Cronkite was momentarily speechless and he took his glasses off and put them on the table and Wow, wild man on the moon, and that was probably the biggest moment, the realization, you know, looking up at the moon, that there were people on the moon. And then hours later, of course, watching the first moonwalk, you know, that was just exciting with Neil jumping off the ladder, you know, the last step and, and uh, you know, making his famous remarks, and, and uh, it was just filled with wonder, you know, I mean, even as a little kid, I knew the world had just changed. I mean, I th felt like just for that moment, the whole world just forgot about fighting and arguing. They just said, wow, you know, humankind has made it to the moon. Chow knew immediately that this was what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. I knew I had to have a plan. I knew I had to do well in school. Uh, so that's the main thing. Do well in school and, and, and keep your health. You know, do things that keep your health good. You know, get enough sleep. You know, don't, don't do drugs. Um, you know, do the right thing and study hard. And that's, those will give you the foundations to do whatever you want. Studying hard was not a challenge for him growing up in a typical Chinese-American environment where education was emphasized. He paid close attention to his health, especially his heart and eyes, for even the slightest heart murmur or vision problem can be an automatic disqualifier for NASA. And of course, luck also played a big role in aligning his stars fortunate in my timing, which I didn't control, that I was applying uh, about seven months before they were going to put a new class together. You know, that, this is back in the days before widespread internet, so I couldn't just look that up. I didn't know when the deadlines were and uh, what they were looking for. So there's a little bit about being in the right place at the right time. Throughout his 15-year career with NASA, Chow performed numerous experiments in space, which in turn contributed to scientific and medical advances here on Earth. During his time on the International Space Station, Chow demonstrated how non-physicians can produce quality ultrasound images that are then transmitted back to Earth for real-time analysis by doctors. Whether it's in, in a place on the Earth or whether it's up in space, 
and you can use a diagnostic tool like an ultrasound, send the image through the internet or the mobile phone system to a doctor located in a big city, and that person can look in real time at the scan out in the field, wherever it is, and make a diagnosis. And so we were able to demonstrate that from the space station. And what's neat is that has been now applied on the ground where people have gone all over developing countries and, and other areas and done real-time diagnoses of people and advise them whether they need to get, get on that donkey and start going to the hospital now or whether they're okay. Even diplomacy can benefit from space missions. Chow has worked closely with astronauts from other nations, including Russia. He says working together on a civil project fosters goodwill on other levels and believes it can do wonders for U.S.-China relations as well. I would argue that having a very visible civil project like that aligns everyone's interest, at least in one area. And so it, it helps keep um, us being nice to each other in other areas as well. And even though the relationship with Russia right now isn't great, uh, I would think it would be a lot worse if we, we didn't have the space station in common. When the shuttle mission came to an end in 2011, it was not only the end of an era, but it also created a practical problem. For now, the only way NASA astronauts can get to and from the International Space Station is to hitch a ride with the Russians. Recent events, like the Russian Progress 59, which spiraled out of control at launch during a routine resupply mission, further highlights the inherent risk associated with space travel. The rocket actually blew up on the way up. And so it affected the same thing. The next crew had to wait, you know, and we had to get everything figured out before we could bring uh, the crew down and bring another crew up. Um, so it again demonstrates the folly of just having one, you know, one failure away from having to abandon the station. Not to mention the tap for this ride is a whopping $71 million. NASA has paid upwards of $400 million a year to the Russians. In 2014, NASA contracted with Boeing and SpaceX to construct commercial rocket ships. And if all goes to plan, by 2017, the U.S. could once again be capable of launching astronauts from American soil. As for the future of the U.S. space program, NASA wants to push further and deeper into space. I'm hopeful that we'll get to Mars in my lifetime, but, um, you know, of course, back in the Apollo days, we thought that we'd be colonizing Mars by the 1990s. Chow now consults on space programs on government and private sectors and relishes in his role as a leader to the Asian American community, encouraging the younger generation to follow in his footsteps. If uh, you want to get ahead, you can't just sit around and wait to be noticed. And I tell them, look, I mean, you know, I did well in school, um, but at the same time, I had to overcome my training and maybe a little bit of natural shyness to be more outgoing and kind of let people know what I've done and what I'm capable of doing, because otherwise I never would have been selected to be an astronaut. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. If you want to trace your family roots and history, be sure to stop by the Peopling of America exhibit right here on Ellis Island. I'm Renabelle DeMillo for Asian American Life. We'll see you next month.